All right. Might as well get this thing over with. So, obviously, considering that this could probably and most likely be the biggest movie of the year. I mean, I know we're only halfway through. Actually, we're probably just a third of the way through of the year. And I can already guarantee that Infinity War is going to be the biggest movie of the year, both commercially and critically. And there's nothing that's going to be topping it, especially after the gangbuster of an opening weekend it did. So, obviously... Not only with that, but also with the fact that it's a Marvel movie and it's the one to really reconvene, reconvene and really restructure the way we look at the MCU after 10 years of buildup. There's naturally going to be a spoiler discussion, especially since this is one of the most spoilery things that can really transcend the internet ever since The Walking Dead became mainstream. And then G Game of Thrones is winding down to its final seasons and its final moments that everybody has that has everybody pretty much talking. So without further ado, it's time for me to revisit the very depressing pain that was Avengers Infinity War. So I'm not even going to bother giving you guys a spoiler warning because the fucking video is titled Spoiler. So if you have seen Infinity War, then there you go. This is the right place for you. But if you have not seen it, all three of you, then please check out my initial spoiler-free review where I talk about the film without giving anything away. It's a little bit on the lengthy, th lengthy side. It's like 16 minutes long or so, and I promised it was going to be a short review. But honestly, I feel like I had to disclose some things while keeping it vague as possible. So check that out. If you by some chance just wanted to watch the opening minute of this video because you just like my face that much. I appreciate it. So with that said, let's tackle the first couple of things that I kind of want to get out of the way before we tackle some of the much more gargantuan things that left us wounded while sitting through the credits just thinking, what the fuck did we just watch? The first couple of things is that I mentioned in my review that there were some things that bothered me about how briskly they were skipped over and how I wish I could have seen certain characters get to certain places in some way or another even if they had a throwaway line I think I always like to follow the rule show don't tell and I don't like it when characters just say oh yeah I did this this and that to get to this point no show me some kind of contextual thing I don't like it that some characters just tells me a movie is a very visual medium so I was a little let down when there were just a couple of lines explaining how Thanos got a hold of the Power Stone. We had our speculations looking at the trailer, seeing him with at least two stones inside of his gauntlet, both the uh, Power Stone and the Space Stone, and we saw Loki handing him the Tesseract, so we kind of figured that at some point in the movie he was going to get the Tesseract. And it was actually a really clever uh, move to make him ha get the Tesseract at the very beginning of the film, because then that allows him to transcend time. He's able to travel. I mean, not, not time, through space. My bad. <laughs> That's later, actually. Through space, he's able to go from one distance to the next with the ability of the Tesseract, aka the Space Stone. Once he gets that, he has no need for the ship that he kind of made his grand entrance with during the end credit sequence of Thor, Thor Ragnarok. He just needed to, you know, activate his little thingy and be able to open up those portals like we saw in the trailers. So it's cool to give him that little... MacGuffin or give him that little ability at the beginning of the movie and kind of empower him and it was cool to see that that was actually our opening film to show us just how big of a threat and how massive he's going to impact this entire universe from the very get-go but the power stone you see him have it even before he grabs a hold of the tesseract and that was just mildly disappointing for me because what would have really hit the nail home is that if we could see him actually eviscerate Xandar to a degree because there were a couple of characters that we had ourselves invested in with Xandar. We can kind of assume at this point that Glenn Close's character and John C. Riley's character, who we saw feel very warmly about when we saw him reunite with his family at the end of Guardians of the Galaxy, is now probably dead. Unless he maybe called out sick that day for work and he managed to skip out on the slaughter that... Thanos probably had given to the entire Nova Corps, not just half, because according to that line by Thor, he only he eviscerated the Nova Corps. So I'm assuming that considering their nature, they're soldiers, technically space soldiers, they're gonna be putting up a fight. They're not gonna just let they're not gonna go out without fighting, even for just half of their team. So Thanos probably had no choice but just to get rid of them all and take the space the yeah, the mind the power stone for himself, and that's where he had it from the get-go. But Again, it would happen in between movies. Kind of wish we would have seen that at least for a split second. But you know what we do see? Red Skull. That was 
fucking amazing. That was one of my favorite moments out of the entire movie. Mainly because it wasn't just one of those moments that you don't just get from a movie. You get from a comic book. You get from a video game where you can tell that the people handling the property are fans themselves. They're not just in it for the money. I mean, the money's awesome. But they're in it because they love this material and they love this stuff just as much as we do. We have a passion for it, and so did they. And that's the kind of move you make when you know you're paying attention. You're not tone deaf. You listen to your audience, and you realize what's working and what's not. And re being having Red Skull be integrated into Infinity War after all these years of all of us wondering what the hell happened to him at the end of First Avenger, where it looked like maybe he died, but considering that the Tesseract is a space stone, and we saw Loki kind of using it, uh, it to, to a degree within Avengers, it's like, okay, well, maybe there's kind of some argument made for Red Skull still being alive, and maybe he'll be pulled out of the uh, pulled out of the shadows at some point, and it looks like they finally did here in Infinity War, and I'm glad to see that they put him in the right place as this Grim Reaper type of figure who's letting people know what is up when they try to get the Soul Stone and how big of a mistake it could be and what type of consequences they're going to have to deal with. So it's cool that out of all characters, a Nazi general was the one that they put in that pathos-driven role where he's like, hey, I made my own mistakes, now it's my turn to for for eternity be stuck in this purgatory to warn you about yours. So I'm like, wow, that's actually rather deserving for a very dedicated Nazi general. But it's cool to see that this character, after all the speculation, is finally brought forward here. Little interesting that out of all the people that they could have cast to replace Hugo Weaving, who made it very adamant that he's not into these movies on, on whatsoever, at least not anymore. It was Ross Marquand, a.k.a. Aaron from The Walking Dead, who was slapped on the makeup and played the Red Skull role in this movie. So that was really cool. I mean, he's killer with impressions, so I expected him to pull his own because he blended right in. I mean, he's already wearing a ton of makeup, but it's cool to see that he was able to handle the voice rather well. And again, this is the type of moment that you would find in a TV animated TV show from a Marvel property or even a comic book where you reward people for sticking around for so long. And this was one of the definitive moments for that. So, all right, so I guess it's time to really start peeling the band-aid slowly but steadily and just let it sink in that sweet, sweet pain of how many casualties we had to deal with here in Infinity War. Before we get to the somewhat slaughter that we had of an ending, let's talk about the the actual deaths that happened along the way leading up to that that I think are possibly the more permanent ones because I feel like all the deaths in this movie got uh, get divided into two categories. You got the ones where it looks like they're for sure dead and they could actually stay that way because of the way they went out versus the one that was more of the the cleansing that we had there at the end with Thanos snapping his fingers after retrieving all the Infinity Stones. The much more nuanced endings that we got sprinkled throughout the film started from the first fucking five minutes of the movie where we get two significant Asgard characters get taken out. And these were the easiest ones to kind of predict. We saw in the trailers that Loki's surrounded by the Black Order and he has no reason to. He has no reason as to hide the Tesseract because, you know, he's Loki. He's the god of mischief. But as we saw him develop over the years with movies like Avengers Infinity War and Thor The Dark World and now most recently Thor Ragnarok, you can see that Loki has grown as a character to where he's not necessarily that much of a... He's almost at an anti-hero at this point where... Yeah, ever so often you can make the fair argument. You can make the fair argument that it's difficult to have Thor be kind of cool and buddy buddy with him after we saw the type of death and destruction he brought forward in uh, Avengers. But at least there was enough time to heal and to kind of let it sink in. So accepting him as this anti-hero figure at the end of Ragnarok was a little easier than it could have been because it could have been worse in the hands of other people, DC. So. Here, in this movie, seeing him take that turn to reveal the Tesseract, not just for his own personal gain, but to make sure that Thor was not killed initially, I'm like, alright, I, I can buy that. That doesn't feel artificial. But, this is Loki, the god of mischief. He's gonna try something, some fiendish thing, and you're just pulling for him not to do it, but you know he's gonna do it. And I'm a little disgruntled by how dumb it was with him hiding the knife. I mean, I think he should have known better... He is the, you know, the wizard of illusion and misdirect and all that. And I feel like he should have 
he should have been able to predict Thanos thinking in a similar way that he could have. And so for him to be stopped with that knife, I'm like, well, yeah, you kind of saw that coming. And death was the only way that that whole scenario was going to result in. I'm just a little shocked by the way it was presented with him being choked out. And usually when characters get choked, you just see him kind of go, oh, like that. But here his eyes get bloodshot. He's got veins popping out of his head. I was like, all right, you're making this a little, you're, 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 throw, you're showing us what Thanos is up. Before that, we did bid farewell to Idris Elba's uh, Heimdall. And this one didn't really bother me that much only because... It wasn't a predicted death, but it was a death that felt, out of the entire movie, this was the only death that felt like it was more like the actor telling the writer, saying, hey, can you write me out of this thing already? Because based on his portrayal in The Dark World and also recently Ragnarok, I just get this impression that Idris Elba doesn't want to do these movies anymore, similar to Hugh Weaving. So him dying, it wasn't that big of a deal for me personally, only because... I, I know how these things kind of work and you can when you see as many movies as I have whether it be a Marvel property or, or some kind of franchise you can start to distinguish the deaths that were made for a creative decision versus the ones that were made more for a contractual one. Then we fast forward to the halfway mark ish or so of the movie and then there goes Gamora. Yeah. That was actually one of the more shocking ones that I just didn't think they were going to go through with but they needed some kind of um, ace in the hole to show us just how rounded and three-dimensional Thanos could be. Because, you know, they knew that after all this build-up, Thanos needed to be delivered as an amazing villain. I mentioned in the review that I remember hearing in an interview or something that the Russos were aiming for Thanos to be the next Darth Vader. But one of the key ingredients to building a great Darth Vader-esque character is to give him a tragedy, whether it be off-screen or on. And we kind of had a semblance of a past tragedy that happened in, in Thanos, with Thanos' background where that he mentioned that happened off-screen where he was given the opportunity to bring balance to the universe because it's almost like he was a general at some point. He was like a leader of his people on Titan and he failed at that. So he was he's trying to make amends for those mistakes and to make sure that everything's perfectly balanced which is always cool which was always cool that i saw from the trailers that he didn't want to kill off the entire universe or conquer the entire universe he still just settled for half and so many people are just like why half that to me is interesting because i've never seen a villain want to do that before so that already made him a compelling villain that he was having a, a plan that i never seen before and it's hard to argue because it's like all right well how is that different from when ever so often I have some of my evil moments and I'm like on the 405 freeway stuck in traffic and I think to myself, you know, maybe the country is a little overpopulated at this point. And that's where Thanos' mythologies ring a little true for me where it's like, okay, I don't want to kill everybody, just half. That way one half can really prosper and live and we can actually thrive as a community, as a species. And that's what Thanos was aiming with. And because I saw that, I was like, okay... But in order for him to achieve this goal, he needed to sacrifice something very valuable for him to to grab the Soul Stone as forewarned by Red Skull, and that was Gamora, which makes sense. I could understand why some people would see this as a sudden like turn around, like oh now now you choose this moment now to care about Gamora after all this time. But if you really pay attention to little details sprinkled throughout Guardians of the Galaxy and then this film, he never really. He never really laid a finger on Gamora. He never really intended to hurt her. I mean, sure, he kind of lied to her and would kind of psychologically torture her by actually inflicting physical pain on Nebula, but he never actually did anything ill will towards Gamora. I mean, he even brought her fucking food when he was uh, had her in captivity. Would he have done that for Nebula? Absolutely not. So yes, in some deranged sort of way, he genuinely loved Gamora. And even though he, was, he wasn't trying to show any kind of emotion when they reunited there uh, on uh, Nowhere, there was, something, th th there was something subtle beneath the, the surface. And you can tell that he was genuinely hurt when he needed to sacrifice. To the point where he didn't even, he didn't even act rough throwing her over the cliff. He was just pulling her like, l l like when a parent is trying to pull their children to go get their booster shots or something like that. But here, it's to kill her. 
And he's just pulling him, just like, come on, I don't want to do this, but please. And you can see the pain on his face. And kudos to Josh Brolin, who was able to bring that across with a motion capture performance. The main, main reason, however, why I believe Gamora is for possibly for sure dead. I mean, you can make arguments as to how the Time Stone can undo all the deaths in this film. But if Marvel wants to have any balls and really hits us in the fields, they'll keep some of these people dead. And I got to be honest, I think Gamora could be one of the few that they can get away with killing off permanently. Because we have a very striking visual that's stuck in our minds with her down on the ground and green blood is like right behind. If you look closely, I know it's a little foggy to keep that PG-13 rating, but behind her head you can see a pool of blood, a green blood just seeping from her head. And it's a, it would really take away from the gut punch that that scene was if you undo it just so that Star Lord can, ha Star -Lord can have his love interest again. Yeah, because it's going to undo that death, and then it's going to undo the shocking reaction that Star-Lord has later on where he comes to the realization that Thanos came back with Agamora, but with the Soul Stone. Then there was the death that everybody was calling, primarily because his body literally encases one of the physical plot devices of the entire movie, Vision, with the Mind Stone. Everybody saw that from a mile away. But it's interesting that they kind of pulled a slight red herring over us where... The entire movie was leading up to a point where Scarlet Witch was going to destroy him in order to destroy the Mind Stone. Only for Thanos to kind of take away at least that little luxury and undo that just so they can rip out the Mind Stone from his head and leave his colorless body down on the ground. And that one didn't hurt me as bad as the Gamora one did only because, like I said, we were all calling it. He needs the Mind Stone in order to be able to complete his plan. So Vision had to go. And even the trailers were kind of teasing us and softening the blow that was to come especially since vision you know he wasn't there the entire way you know he wasn't there from phase one he was inducted into this entire plethora of characters with age of ultron so he wasn't gonna have that lasting impact but what was kind of interesting is that right before he had his own fair share of fighting to do shuri was trying to save him by trying to separate his consciousness and i do believe to a degree at least, that I don't think the screenwriters would have put that in there at all if it wasn't going to play some big role, possibly in Avengers 4. And we didn't see the aftermath of Shuri's little encounter there with the Black Order inside of the room, so she just got knocked out. But right before that happened, she did grab her hard drive. Did she at least, at some level, manage to har harbor as much of Vision's mind as she possibly could and could that maybe be the key to defeating Thanos in 4? What we do know is that Thanos did get a hold of the Mind Stone, completed his Infinity Gauntlet, and snapped his fingers in a really villainous moment telling uh, Thor, dude, you should have just aimed for the head. You know, you should have seen enough. You should have been on Earth long enough to have seen some zombie movies and should have aimed for the head. And because of that, Thanos snaps his fingers manages to see Gamora in a vision which has people saying okay was that just a vision or you know just some kind of ghostly figure or maybe Gamora's consciousness somehow lives on through interdimensional I don't know it's a little it starts to kind of break the brain at that point but Thanos eviscerates half of the universe and this is where shit gets kind of heavy but at the same time a little divisive among some people because I've seen some comments on Twitter, both on Fa Twitter and Facebook, saying that most of the people that get turned into Ash by the end of this film, uh, mainly from our Avengers team, we know that they're going to get sequel films. So everybody's quick to go, yeah, they're going to get a sequel, so they're going to come back to uh, at some point, right? Avengers 4, they're going to undo this, it's fine, it's, you know, no problem, they're going to be fine. And we, you can make that very firm argument for some of the, uh, some of the characters taken out here via the little ash projection there, where they just go peace out and they disintegrate, because they made some of the more lucrative films. In fact, one of them just made the the third most highest grossing film of all time. How can Marvel fuck that up? Well, just because in the future we have a level of of knowing that yeah they're going to be back doesn't take away from the actual emotional punch that was that moment sitting in the theater and watching these characters who we grew to love just kind of wisp away into the wind. Because, yeah, we might know that they'll be back later, but 
But there's just something just so shocking of seeing them go through with it, at least within this moment of the final five minutes of this movie, that just strikes to the core because of how well that they were acted and how well that they were written within their singular movies. And the biggest misdirect of this uh, of all of this was Black Panther. Because that whole scene there was just shot in such an immaculate way that I'm like, wow, you really had us going. Because it made it look like a, a Okoye, played by Denai Guerrera, she was going to be the one to disintegrate because it looks like she was hurting. Only for T'Challa to be like, it's okay, I got you. Like that. I'm like, what? He just had his movie. He just had his movie. Why would you do this now? <laughs> But then you see some others that I'm like, okay, yeah, there were second tier characters. There were interesting characters, but I'm like, all right, well, yeah, they ended up going like Sam Wilson, Bucky. And then we get the one that, I mean, we had the majority of the Guardians, including Star-Lord, leaving Rocket Raccoon to be alone once again. That's hurtful. And if that wasn't bad enough, you're going to leave him watching Groot go again? Again? I we were watching the movie and literally when that shot was shown of Groot disintegrating, some guy in the front was like, "Not again!" I'm like, "Yeah, I, I feel it, man." But it's fine, you know, it's cool. Somebody even theorized that because Groot used part of his arm to build Stormbreaker, maybe that could grow Groot back. I don't know. Maybe he's a fucking tree. I, I just water the axe. <laughs> water the axe. It should be fine. Then came the most painful one. I think everybody can agree this is the most painful death that we see during the la last five minutes of the movie uh, with Thanos' finger snap. And that's, of course, our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Because he's just a kid. He's just a kid. He doesn't know any better. He wasn't even supposed to be there. He even says at one point he should have just stayed on the bus. And then to see him kind of break down and have a very genuine reaction to death, knowing that he's about to like just fade away it, it it broke everybody's hearts it broke everybody's hearts and that was the moment that i mentioned in my review that was close to moving me to tears where i'm just like mm, keep it together man just keep it together and and uh and he goes and tony looks incredibly shook by it one can only imagine if pepper ended up going as well it, it back on earth and maybe that's just gonna take tony to the brink and all that he has left on that planet, like I said, all of the Guardians went. He's only got Nebula to help him out, which is a very unlikely pairing. But what's also very interesting after all of these deaths is to note that pretty much all of our Phase 1 Avengers made it out alive, including the two that everybody was predicting was going to die, which was the... which was... If that wasn't subverting expectations, then I don't know what was. And Marvel has always been good at that, whether it be with its films or even with their Netflix shows or even some of the mainstay ABC TV shows. I know Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., I always cover this in my reviews where I'm like, wow, way to misdirect and subvert my expectations because I was not expecting that. And they did that again here where you come to a realization that Captain America and Tony, who we clearly thought were going to die, me personally, I thought Cap was going to die and then Tony was going to die in four, which could still happen. But none of both of them made it out of this movie alive. And that's curious. That's a humongous misdirect that we didn't see coming. And it's interesting to see that along with the two of them, all of our main Avengers from Phase 1, including Black Widow, Hulk, and Thor, made it out alive. So it's up to them to fix this whole thing and bring it out, down to an end in Avengers 4. Now, with all these characters disintegrating, I always thought that there was like the option of bringing some back and then keeping some dead. I mean... You can make a, a discussion for how you can maybe keep Bucky or Sam or this, somebody there kind of dead. Or if you are going to bring some people back like Spidey and Black Panther who are for sure going to be getting their sequel. Especially Black Panther who made a shit ton of money. There's got to be some kind of twist where they don't come back all the way. Maybe their mind's a little messed up. Or maybe they come back... In a different place in the universe. And it, their next film is going to be that adventure in that, pl in that brand new place. That's not necessarily Earth, Wakanda, Queens, New York, or whatever. So you got to change up the game. You got to... If you're not going to handle death in a very permanent way, then you at least got to make death a kind of vehicle for something different that's going to come in the future that we're not expecting. So they could do that with some of these characters that they're bringing back. As for the characters that they're going to be bringing forward that are brand new, 
Obviously, we have the end credit stinger, which is only one this time, but which is cool because I thought at one point, I thought to myself, wouldn't it be ballsy that out of all of these MCU movies, it's this one, Infinity War, that does not have a single end credit scene? I was like, holy shit, especially when all of the little flashing end credits end, especially with, oh my god, Avengers Infinity War disintegrating. By the way, was it just me, or did anyone think that the two eyes in Infinity, in Infinity got... Di- the, like the the all the words disintegrated and there were two eyes that stayed for like a fraction of a second before they got wished away it's almost like they were saying infinity war 2 i don't know that's just me I, I, that's just probably i don't know i don't know what i'm thinking about but after that no end credit scene i thought i was like oh god damn that would take some going ads if you guys do not attach something but they did and of course they couldn't have thought anybody else better to Give us an end credit scene than the guy him, himself who brought the Avengers team together. Uh, uh, sorry, it's, it's late. Cap- uh, uh, Nick Fury, along with Kobe Smulders, Mariah Hill, th- trying to find some connections to either. Uh, I know Ant Man was mentioned earlier in the film, being on some kind of mission or whatever, or some heist, which was pro- which might be detailed in Ant Man and the Wasp. In fact, I would not be surprised if Ant Man and the Wasp starts off with a little tag saying. 2017 or early 2018 and it ends with a disintegration type thing maybe wasp is the one to go oh f- <laughs> maybe wasp goes and Ant-Man's like no and he's he has a reason to join the team once more in four but uh clint barton aka hawkeye he's out on a mission and fury's trying to get a hold of him of course the apop apocalyptic or rather rapture like nature of this purging by Thanos' finger snap starts to take place you see cars with no drivers veering off the freeway or you got a helicopter crashing and that was really what was eerie about this entire finger snap is that it had some kind of real world level to it where if you're a religious person or a god fearing uh, individual you know that the rapture is one of the scariest things on earth because you have half of the people going to heaven, and the other half have to stay here and deal with some really hellish shit. And that's always creepy to find their clothes and they're just gone all of a sudden. It's some apocalyptic type of events. And that's kind of what's going on here in this end credit scene to show you the scale of how bad this is getting, including the disintegration of Mariah Hill and Fury himself. But before he can finish his trademark motherfucker, he sends out a message via a very riggedy looking 90s pager. And it was through that 90s pager that I thought to myself, ah, I think what this is, the logo flashes, we get our little tease of Captain Marvel. Letting us know that this is probably somebody that we should not be just sleeping on. We shouldn't be looking at this Captain Marvel and be like, okay, a solo film, but when's Avengers 4? No, she's going to have some lasting rippling effects on not only within within her own movie, but within the MCU as soon as Avengers 4 rolls out. The only other closing remarks that I can kind of come up with in the spoiler discussion would be any other things that we can kind of speculate. I mean, those were some of the more concrete things we were left with when the film cut us off with that cliffhanger. But the only two other things that we'll throw in, these are all my only two cents. It's one, are we going to need some kind of new Infinity Gauntlet? Because that thing looked toast after he did the finger snap. And possibly along with the Infinity Stones uh, along with it. Although I doubt. I think they looked like they were still fine. But the Gauntlet is probably not working anymore. Did Peter Dinklage's character, which was an amazing, amazing trick they did uh, i mean i don't know if this is considered offensive but i love that they took peter dinklage a dwarf actor and made him a fucking giant bigger than thor i thought man i hate you guys <laughs> i hate you for so cl- uh, for how clever you guys can possibly be at times but if he did not disintegrate will he play a larger role in avengers 4 in developing a brand new gauntlet or a brand new weapon that could be used against thanos with those stones so that's my takeaway from that and is Hulk going to come out to play? Because one of the biggest, uh, quote, you know, disappointments, even though it wasn't that big of a deal, was that Hulk pussied out in this movie. All right. Yes, we saw him in the opening scene. But as we could, as we saw, Thanos laid the shit down on him, which was pre- a pretty cool scene because it showed just how bi- much of a soldier and militant person Thanos was. Because the way that he was boxing, it looked like boxing. It looked some tactical shit. Because Hulk is obviously a little mindless. He's just all about Hulk smash. Thanos looked like he was calculating his moves. So that was pretty cool. And it was enough to scare Hulk away 
by hiding inside of Banner, and Banner had to resort to using the Hulkbuster. And it was cool that Hulk, that uh, Banner was the one inside of Hulkbuster this entire time, and it wasn't remotely activated, or it wasn't Tony being inside of it. That was actually pretty neat. So Aldo Jones, you called it when you made your weird trailer and you showed ah, Mark Ruffalo ah, inside of the helmet. That was actually him. So nice prediction there, dude. But will Hulk come back to actually play a bigger role and actually lay the SmackDown in four? Is it going to be the traditional Green Hulk? Or do you think that maybe, just maybe, Banner will have an internal conflict or dialogue with Hulk? The two minds will mesh together. And we'll see Grey Hulk. If you guys are not familiar with Grey Hulk, Grey Hulk is like a slightly smart-ass, kind of asshole version of the Hulk, but he's sentient. Like, he's able to, he's able to talk with full, you know, sentences of dialogue. He, he's the, he doesn't speak in broken English like Hulk kind of did in Ragnarok. He, he's actually like a sentient person, but he's got the power of the Hulk. Uh, so, that will be pretty neat. I don't know if maybe he'll work on screen 100%, but... He's definitely something that could be a very valuable asset going up against Thanos. Guys, if you're just as big of a Marvel fan as I am, then you know that we can go on and on and on with different theories and speculations and little predictions that we could come up with that we could took away from this ending, especially if we were to go back and revisit this movie multiple times and revisit that depressing shit multiple times. But for now, these were the main bullet points that I kind of jotted down on the list to talk about in my spoiler discussion. And I don't have anything to add at the moment, but I think that you guys do. So please let me know in the comments below what are you guys' feelings and theories on the next Avengers, as well as this new Infinity War, and how much it hurt you. Just where exactly did it touch you? You know, just let me know in the comments below. Obviously, it's a spoiler discussion, so feel free to d talk about whatever it is that you want. Also, make sure to support the video by hitting the like and share. And, of course, do not forget to subscribe for more videos. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys on the next one. Some person just made off with somebody's purse, and you got to go catch them. And it's a little bit time sensitive, but at least it gets the urgent feeling of being a superhero where you have to go take care of this random crime because random crime happens and they put it here in this game and then some fucking kid loses his balloon be good now what do we say i never let my balloony go again you were supposed to say thank you you little shit god damn it <laughs> he just abandoned his child